intros. Well, what a great message, Brother Cloyd. Thank you so much for that. And he, he, knew, he must have known right where I was headed. Now, I want you to turn to Mark's Gospel, first chapter, the call of the disciples. As we look on this senior day, uh, I want to talk about growing through the years with Jesus. Here's where we first meet this man, Mark 1, verse 16. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. He immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat putting their nets in order. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Heavenly Father, this is your word. Send your Holy Spirit and teach us your word and call us today to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, I... Uh, through the years, I've preached many a senior adult service. I've done some senior adult revivals, and now I are one. You know, that's a, that's a little strange feeling, you know. When you reach 70, you feel like, well, okay. Uh, I, re I, I can still remember a few things. I graduated from high school in 1965, and uh, I remember it was the days when the long hair was just coming in. The Beatles had hit America. And uh, all my friends had long hair, and now today they're longing for hair. <laughs> it was the beginning of acid rock in the 60s, and now it's acid reflux. <laughs> Goodness. Remember talking about back in the 60s and 70s about there's this new place they've opened up. Let's go to a hip new joint. Now it's, you know where I'm headed. It's time to get a new hip joint. <laughs> I remember the Rolling Stones in the 60s, and now I think about kidney stones, and I avoid <laughs> kidney stones. Remember when you were 15 or 16 and you were trying to pass the driver's test, and now here we are trying to keep pass the vision test so we can keep our driver's license. Oh, I'll tell you what. There was a couple in church his name was Jacob, he was 92, and Rebecca was 89. They had both been widowed years before, and they'd been sort of sitting together in church for a long time, decided they'd get married. And they were walking along downtown one day past the Walgreens, and he said, hey, let's go in here. We're going to get married, let's go in here. So he walked up to the pharmacist and said, hey, we're getting married. Do you sell heart medication? He said, sure we do. Do you sell... Medicine for circulation? Yeah, well, all kinds. How about rheumatism and arthritis? Sure we do. How about memory problems? Yes, uh, we sell medicine for memory. How about, how about vitamins and sleeping pills and Geritol? Absolutely. Do you sell wheelchairs and walkers? He said all speeds and all sizes. So he turned to Rebecca and said, Honey, we're going to use this place for our bridal registry. Boy, the older we get, we, many times we find ourselves the clan leader. Have you reached that point in your life yet? I'm the clan leader of, of my, my family. I'm the oldest one. Since the passing of my father and mother about 25 years ago, all my uncles and aunts have died. Now I'm the old guy in the family. They look at me, I can't be the old guy in the family, but I am. I'm the historian. I'm the family history keeper, the storyteller. It's a strange feeling to be the oldest one left in your family. To be the only one who remembers all the old timers and the fun times and the sad times and the adventures and, and the deaths. And I'm the only one who can tell them, they say, where's so-and-so buried? I'll tell them where they're buried, you know, what cemetery to go to. You know what I mean. Some of you know exactly what I mean. It's an odd feeling. Well, John, the disciple of Jesus, must have felt that way sometimes himself. He was a young man when he was called by Jesus, along with his brother James, to 
follow me. Along the Sea of Galilee where they were fishing, he and his brother and his father had a fishing business and, and, and one day Jesus passed by there and called him and said, come on, I want to make you fishers of men. And he was just a young disciple. I, I get the idea from John 20 that he was young, one of the younger guys in there. He and Simon Peter were together on that first resurrection morning and when Mary Magdalene came running and said, they've taken the Lord's body, the tomb is empty, something's happened weird, you need to come check it out. And the Peter and John began running and it says, and uh, the other one, John, outran Peter. I get the idea he was, uh, he was younger. He's the first one to reach the empty tomb. He was the first one of these disciples to look inside and see the grave clothes just collapse there like, well, what in the world has happened? Yeah, he was one of the first disciples. And one by one, all the disciples began to die out. John lived on. And another one would die or be crucified or, or something would happen and John would live on. Not counting Judas Iscariot, the first of the twelve to die was John's dear brother and fishing buddy, James. James and John, sons of Zebedee, ones you heard me read about right here in Mark chapter 1. First one to die, after Judas, of course, was James. It's tough losing your fishing buddy, isn't it? It's tough losing your brother. It must have been an awful feeling to think, boy, Herod has killed my brother with a sword. And now I'm left of this family. And one by one, all the rest of them began dying out. Acts 12 tells the story of the death of James. Most of the other deaths of the disciples are not mentioned in the scriptures. But you know, you wonder, you hear about this, and you must be thinking, you know, sometimes if you're John, boy, I'm the last one left. Oh, Peter, I heard he went off to Rome, and he got crucified upside down by Nero. And Andrew, his brother, well, they, he went to Greece, and they killed him there. And, and uh, you know, Philip went off to Egypt and was scourged and crucified there. And Thomas, I, I heard a rumor that he's gone all the way to India and, and is preaching the gospel over there. And on and on it went until... You realize all of them are gone now except me. I'm the last one left. I'm the, I'm the leader, the last one who remembers walking with Jesus every day and had that call. The last of the 12. I guess it got lonely sometimes. I guess sometimes John said, you know, I sure do miss them. Even old hard-headed, loud mouth Peter. I miss those guys. They're all up there in heaven or with the Lord now. And I guess they're thinking, I didn't make it. You know? Poor old John didn't make it. But I, I, I'm still living down here, and, and, and I guess i got to quit eating all these brand and fiber and all that kind of stuff so I can go on and join them, you know, one of these days. He was well into his 90s. You ever wonder why you're still living if you're well into your 90s and you think, well, I don't know what, what I'm doing around here. A lot of people over the years have asked me, why is the Lord leaving me here? My spouse has gone on. All my friends are gone. Why has the Lord left me here? My predecessor, one of my predecessors at First Baptist Milton was Dr. Joe Bamberg. He served that church 33 years. In 2008, he died. He told me just shortly before he died, David, I don't know why the Lord's left me here. I'm well into my 90s. I have bad health. About all I can do is mess around. And I don't want to hang around if, if all I can do is just sort of mess around, you know. Why am I still here? A lot of people have asked that question. One woman who was 95 was, you know, somebody asked her, reckon why the Lord's left you here? She said, just to test the patience of my relatives, I guess. <laughs> you know about that. But the truth was that God left John here for a really big reason. He had a purpose. John was the one he chose to testify, to teach, to write well into the latter part of that first century, the last one left. There was a reason God left him here. There was, the work was not done yet. So if you're ever asking yourself, why has God left me here for so long? Think about John living a long time, but listen to this, still Growing in Christ, as we sang a while ago, pressing on. Still pressing on. 
Maybe in my 90s, but I'm still pressing on, John could say. Going on and on and on. Still growing in Christ. You know, one of the saddest things in the world is to is when a doctor says about a child, a baby, this child is failing to thrive. Just not developing right. Not gaining the weight. Not doing the things that a child ought to do. Arrested development. Sometimes we talk about that term. But John was still growing in Christ even into his 90s. Are you still growing in Christ whether you're in your teens or your 20s or your 90s? Are you still growing in Christ or are you just retired? John was still growing in Christ. Let me explain. He was growing in his compassion. A lot of people don't grow in their compassion for other people, do they? Well, we get less patient and we get less tolerant of other people sometimes. Are you like that as you get older? Do you find yourself having less patience? And these people get on my nerves all the time. Family, friends, all kinds of things. Do you find yourself growing in compassion and maybe being more tolerant of other people? Remember Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 40? John came up to Jesus and said, Well, we just saw some guy casting out demons in your name. And I told him to shut up. He wasn't one of us. And Jesus said, what are you doing? Don't stop people who are testifying in my name. Grow a little more compassion. Grow more patient with people. But Jesus wanted us to grow. Jesus said, he who is not against us is for us. Grow up. Push out your horizons. Stop criticizing other people for crying out loud as we get older. I want to tell you something. I know this comes as a great shock. But criticism is not one of the spiritual gifts. So if, if that's all you got left, you say, well, criticism is my gift, you know. I, I'm here to straighten out everybody else. No, you're not. Get your own backyard cleaned up. And when that's done, the sun will go down. It'll be time to go. You know. Are you growing? Are you growing in your compassion? Do you remember something that happened in Luke nine fifty one? Jesus had set his face to go to Jerusalem. It was that last trip, and they were passing. He and his disciples were passing through a Samaritan village. They'd come from Galilee, coming through a Samaritan village. And they said, I think we'll stay here tonight. We need, to, we need to get some supplies and find a place to stay tonight. And some people in that Samaritan village told them, get out. We don't like y'all. Get out of here. So James and John, the sons of thunder, it says there. I don't know whether it's because they had such tempers or whether their father Zebedee was called thunder because he was, I don't know. Maybe he was a thunderous kind of a man. Anyway, James and John said to Jesus, that just wasn't right. You want us to pray? Call down fire from heaven and kill them all? And Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy. I came down here to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, John certainly grew in compassion for the lost and hurting people. I can tell you that because he later went to Gentile lands. He spent his last years, it appears, in Ephesus trying to reach the lost people up there in in those Gentile lands. Are you like that? Are you growing more mission-minded as you get older? If you decide I've done all the mission and all the evangelism and all the witnessing that I should have ever done. I've, I've done all that and I'm through and I'm done. Are you, are you growing in your understanding of people and growing more compassionate for other people and more Christ-like, more patient, more forgiving? Are you growing like that or just growing old? Let me tell you something else. John grew to understand that serving others is greater than being served. Because we reach that point, whether we're 90 or 80 or 70 or whatever, we think, you know, I've done my part. I think it's time for everybody else to step up and I'm just going to retire from God, from church and everything else. I know people like that. You know people like that. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm, I'm through. I've done enough. I've served my time. I've heard that so many times. Remember, remember how James and John got to listen to Jesus talking about 
the kingdom is here, the kingdom is here. And when the Son of Man comes into his kingdom, they got to talking one day. Hey, hey, James, hey, John. You know what? He, he's about to do something. He's about to establish his kingdom. We need to save some seats. Let's get Mama. Let's get Mama to ask him. Yeah, get Mama. He couldn't tell Mama no. So they get their Mama to go and say, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, will you let one of my boys sit on your right hand and the other one on your left hand? And Jesus had a long talk with them all right there. That, that's, that's not something you need to worry about. It's where you're going to sit in heaven. You need to, to become a servant and, and to remain a servant through these years. The greatest, if you want the seats of the greatest, you need to be the greatest servant of all. That's right. You know, the disciples seem to be squabbling several times in their mission about who's the greatest, who's the greatest among us. One time Jesus walking along, he hears them discussing something in the back, and he says, what are y'all talking about back there? Uh, we were talking about which one of us was the greatest. The what? The greatest. Why would you be talking about that? Why would you be doing that? The greatest among you must be your servant. He took a child and, and, and put that child, the greatest among you must become humble. You, you, need to, you need to be a servant. And they got the greatest lesson of that, that Thursday night before Jesus was crucified, didn't they? Jesus told the disciples on that Thursday morning, apparently go into Jerusalem and get that room that we prepared and, and, and you guys get all the stuff ready for the Passover, the lamb, the bread, the, you know, all, all the other stuff that we have to have there. And you go set the tables. And you get everything ready. And, and, and then Jesus and the rest of the disciples came along. And everything appeared to be ready except they forgot one thing. They're standing around there saying, uh-oh. We realize that in every house where people have been traveling, when they come for the Passover or for any feast whatsoever, you always have a servant to wash their feet. I mean, they didn't wear socks. They wore sandals. They got dust and dirt all over them, and, and it was just the most common of courtesies for you to have a servant to wash their feet. One of you decide, okay, who's going to be washing the feet? Now, sometimes you had servants who couldn't do anything else, couldn't plow a straight furrow, couldn't work in the store, the shops, or anything else. Well, you can get a bowl of water and a towel and at least wash everybody's feet. And so they stood around there that night with all of them with dirty feet, I said, uh-oh, we forgot something. Can't you hear them whispering to each other? James, get that bowl over there and start washing feet. You know, we forgot that. Simon, you can do it. I'm not going to do it. Nathaniel, oh, no, not me, not me. You see, the lowest down servant is the one who always did that. And nobody's going to admit to being the lowest down servant. So you know what Jesus does? Yeah, you know. He gets a bowl of water and a towel and he goes to his disciples one by one and begins washing their nasty feet. Peter said, Lord, you can't wash my feet. He said, yes, I can. You must be washed in many ways. And Jesus washed their feet. And he said, you know, I've done this for you. I'm your Lord and your master. And I've done this for you. Now you need to do this for other people. You need to be a servant and get over the idea that everybody's here to serve you. John learns that lesson. The greatest among you is your servant. I've been around churches for a long time as a pastor and as a church member. I'll tell you something. Real servants are rare and they are precious and they are Christ-like. And they don't quit. They don't retire. They grow on, they go on growing in service. So are you growing in your service or just sort of quitting? Say, I've done enough. I'm, I'm, I'm through. I'm done here. I think this man right here, I, I, Brother Wes, bless your heart. <laughs> At his age, he's still serving this church. Amen. He's still, yeah. He hasn't quit. He hasn't decided, you know, I'm too old to do any of this. He may feel it sometimes. <laughs> but he still serves. 
this church and, and what a blessing it is. Just do you know him? He is such a blessing just for you to know. So don't quit, don't retire, but grow in your service to the Lord in the Lord's church. John learned something else. He learned that sacrificial love is the most powerful redemptive force in all of the world. He was the only disciple at the cross as far as we could tell. He saw it all. He saw the nails being driven through Jesus' hands and feet. Jesus spoke to him from the cross and said, John, I trust you to take care of my mother. And he watched Jesus suffer and die. And he held Jesus' mother up when she was about to collapse with grief. The cross overshadows everything in John's gospel. You know that? Over, I mean, from the earliest chapters of John's gospel. It's the cross, it's the cross, it's the death of Jesus. It's the sacrifice, it's the grace of God. And John wrote about that in his 90s, probably. He hasn't gotten over. He's growing in his understanding of sacrificial love. I can hear him, can't you, telling those people at Ephesus, so they said in his last years they had to pick him up and carry him to church because... He was just unable to walk anymore, and he would say, they'd all sit around and say, Brother John, do you have anything to say to us today? And can't you just imagine him saying, Did I ever tell you all about Nicodemus? You ought to read the third chapter of my gospel. He was a good man, but he needed to be redeemed. And Jesus said, You must be born again. Did I, did I ever tell you? Did I ever tell you about that? time we were passing through Samaria and this woman who'd been married five times got into a discussion with Jesus. She was divorced. And she was just living with a guy now and, and, and she was so overwhelmed by her sin and her guilt and Jesus saved her. He loved her. Did I ever tell you all about the, about the time that we were in Jerusalem and we met a man who had been crippled for 38 years and Jesus redeemed that man. Did I ever tell you, you ought to read the ninth chapter of my, of my book about a blind man. And Jesus came and had compassion and love on that man and, and redeemed him. Did I ever tell you about that woman they dragged before us one day in, in Jerusalem? They caught her in the very act of adultery. They didn't bring the man, but they brought the woman, of course. And, and, and Jesus talked to her and they were ready to stone her and Jesus saved that woman, redeeming love. And then he went to the cross. Did I ever tell you all about the cross? Did I ever tell you why he went to the cross? Can't you hear John explaining that to those people as the years went by in his 80s and 90s and still going on? The cross. John was the one that recorded, the only one that recorded those words of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John's the one who wrote that down, John 3, 16. So he never got over the feeling that redemptive love is the most powerful thing in the world. When he writes, when he writes his first letter, 1 John, it's about love, the love of God, and the love that we ought to have for each other. I'll tell you something. He, he talked about the cross the cross became dearer and dearer and dearer to him. Has it become dearer to you? Do you catch yourself singing about the cross? On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. You, you ever catch yourself singing that, you know? And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Do you find yourself cherishing the cross as you get older? Or is that just something dim in the past? Grow. Grow in your love and appreciation for the cross of Christ. One other thing that John learned is that discipleship and the learning about Jesus lasts a lifetime. A long, long time. Even if you're 90 years old. You see, it was in his 80s and 90s when John wrote the gospel. I guess he had read Matthew, Mark, and Luke and said, y'all left out a few things. And the Holy Spirit said, that's why I'm letting you write this one. And he writes some things that are not found in the others. It's very different from the others. And he wrote the gospel and he traveled through Asia Minor and he wrote three letters and, 
And then he was locked up for preaching the word of God and put in a penitentiary on a, on a little rock island, an Alcatraz type place, hot little island where he spent some time and said he could have said, Lord, I mean, I'm 90. Is this what I get? Is this the best you can do for me? Lord, I, I've been with you this long, long time. Why have you put me here? And then the Lord revealed to him visions that no other man ever had. Visions, wonderful things. Visions of victory over the enemies of Christ. Wow, visions of Satan's defeat. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The end of the world. Even a couple of chapters, he gave us just a little, little bit of heaven to tell us this is what it's going to be. Just a little taste of heaven. Maybe in our latter years, they're often hard years, but Jesus has much to teach and to show us, even as seniors, doesn't he? So let me ask you again, what are you becoming? Are you growing in grace and compassion? Are you growing in your prayer life and your service? Are you growing in your love for other people? Your appreciation for missions? Are you growing in your appreciation of the cross? Or are you just growing older? Here's a difference, you know. There was a house with a mom and dad and a little boy named Tommy, and a little girl, a little sister. But Tommy was the central character here. So one day they had a talk and they said, uh, we're going to have some changes in our household. The kids said, what, what's happening? They said, well, Grandma can't live by herself anymore, so Grandma's coming to stay with us. And it's going to make some changes in our household. What kind of changes? Well, Tommy, you're going to have to give up your room here on the first floor and move up to the guest room on the second floor to save Grandma some steps. She can't climb those stairs. And Grandma moved in and took Tommy's room, and he didn't like it so much, but he lived with it. But every time something had to be done, they say, Tommy, take this in there. Save Grandma some steps. Tommy, take this medicine. Tommy, help Grandma. Save her some steps. Tommy, take this to Grandma. Finally, he had enough of it one day. He said, what in the world are we saving Grandma for? Do you ever ask yourself that same question? What are we saving me for? Vance Habner was probably the most quoted preacher in America in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. He lived way on up into his, in, past his 80s, 90s. He died in 1986. He was a great preacher, one of the most inspiring speakers I've ever heard in my life. At his 80th birthday, his people, a lot of people gathered around, had a big birthday party for him. A lot of preachers were there for that. And somebody said, you're 80 years old. You're in bad health. I said, what, uh, do you have any, any goals or, or have you done everything you want to do in your life? Vance Havner said, here's my life's goal. I want Jesus to be the Lord of whatever is left. So, what, are you, what about you? What is your goal now? On this senior adult day in 1918, whatever age you are, What's your goal, whether you're a teenager or whether you're 90? What's the goal? Is your goal that Jesus gets the best of whatever's left in your life? I hope you commit yourself to that today. And as we close this service today, we always want to invite you, if Christ has touched your heart, if you've been redeemed and loved, we invite you to come this morning and... Uh, Say, I, I, I've given my heart to Christ. Would you pray with me? Maybe you're looking for a church home. Maybe you're looking to be baptized. Whatever your decision is, if God's laid it on your heart, keep growing in Christ and give him the best of whatever is left. Let's stand now. Let's have our hymn of invitation, and I invite you to come this morning. God calls you.